So before I start the space, I'm going to put a couple of posts in the replies just to get amplify some things going on. Wait a few minutes. Okay, so I'm going to read My People Shall Live by Layla Khalid. At a time right now where the Zionist settlers are currently bombing Palestine and the Palestinians and basically live streaming a final solution and genocide in which they exterminate people. So, among other things, I wanted to read about a revolutionary there because what happens during these times of resistance and uprising is that, and what we're witnessing, is that the empire will make a spectacle out of lynching these people publicly. And like Ida B. Wells has taught us, the spectacle of lynching is to intimidate others to not resist. So I want to read about a revolutionary so we can remember that, yes, the genocide is happening in Palestine because of the West backing the Zionists. But that also, too, that the Palestinian people are in an active revolt and a resistance movement. And that we should amplify that movement and solidarity by not only learning what's going on, but understanding what they're fighting for is a fight that we all are a part of, whether we know it or not. So this is called My People Shall Live by Layla Khalid. This is an introduction. The forced exodus of the Palestinian people from their ancestral homeland is one of the most dramatic stories of modern times. Yet after a quarter of a century, that story remains for the most part untold. The picture presented to the outside world is that they communicated by the hollow political and military pronouncements of Arab states or by the Israeli Zionist conquerors and the world Zionist organizations. Palestinians, have not spoken for themselves, their self-appointed trustees and mediators act without authorization. My generation, the generation of Leila Khalid and the Popular Front, intends to speak for itself with the true Arab revolutionary voice. The echo shall be heard from the coming decades. It is this very voice that the forces of reaction and darkness, Arab, Israeli, and imperialists alike, are hoping to still forever. The graduates of Auschwitz and the mythical, quote-unquote, pioneers of the Third Leia who founded the Zionist state are responsible for the persecution, disbursement, and continuous alienation of the Palestinian people. As European settlers, they imported with them not only European and American technology, but the West's contempt for native populations. Those interlopers and their fabled sovereign offsprings dominate the government the military, and labor federation, and every socio-economic institution in Israel. The sanctimonious attitude of the ruling clique towards their own technological and cultural superiority is further reinforced by a chronic Masada siege ment- uh, mentally with which feeds on its own self-induced paranoia. And I have to say, I'm terrible at pronouncing these words, unfortunately, because they're unfamiliar to me. So. If anyone is knowledgeable about them, don't hesitate to correct me in my DMs. I do want to learn how to say it correctly. But for those listening to the recording, this is not the correct way to pronounce a lot of this. The sanctimonious attitude of the ruling clique towards their own technological and cultural superiority is further reinforced by a chronic 
Masada siege mentality, which feeds on its own self induced paranoia. The terror is of an impeding Holocaust waged by holy Arab warriors against poor besieged Zion, the latter, of course, being a self helping, self cultivating, self determining, peaceful community. The Manchain state of mind has been exploited by the World Zionist Organization to extort funds from Jews and guilt ridden liberals the world over. WZO, as the loyal servant of imperialism, has been able to deceive the public and win over Western governments because it speaks the language of the West. More than half a century has elapsed since the barbaric and systematic obliteration of the Palestinian people began. Nearly a quarter century has passed since Layla Khalid was evicted from her home in Haifa. Layla was expelled from her homeland in 1948 at the age of four. Her home on Stanton Street in Haifa is now occupied by European Zionists who claim to have a higher right than she did. Layla became a refugee child, one of the hundreds of thousands of Palestinians forced out of their country to make room for victims of European inhumanity. Layla was among the more fortunate Palestinians. Her family lived in one room rather than in a tent in a refugee camp. Yet, she knows by personal experience what it means to be a refugee. She is now full-time revolutionary. She is discovering the true meaning of being a Palestinian in its original canon and definition, a heroic fighter, a warlike person, a selfless fellow. To Layla, history has determined her vocation and destiny has decreed her role. To the Palestinian and Arab people, Layla is the symbol of liberated womanhood the devoted patriot who, with the popular front, will end tyranny and exploitation in the Arab homeland. To the friends of revolution everywhere, Layla is hope restored, humanity rediscovered, self-respect regained. This book is not a historic document, nor is it an academic analysis of the highly complicated Arab Zionist imperialist civil war of the past quarter century. It is rather the personal portrait of a Palestinian revolutionary who lived through the period as a child of revolution and as a participant observer. Revolutionaries and lovers have yet to write of the struggle. Layla Khalid is a revolutionary and a humanist. This is her story and the story of her people and their fight for freedom. Layla generously gave her time and talent to the task of reconstructing her life as a revolutionary. Thanks also must go to her comrades for their help in creating this book. Part one, the badge of infamy, deprivation and discovery. One, the staircase. Come forward, poor of the earth and cover this time with tatters and tears. Cover it with the body that seeks its warmth, the city, arcs of madness. I thought revolution should give birth to its children. So I buried millions of songs and came. This is a quoted from Adonis. Children testify, page 168. I come from the city of Haifa. Again, I'm mispronouncing this really bad because I'm unfamiliar with these words, but those who are listening to the recording and are familiar, don't hesitate to leave a message in my DMs. I'm very much accepting of, of learning. I come from the city of Haifa, but I remember little of my birthplace. I can see the area where I played as a child, but of our house, I only remember the staircase. I was taken away when I was four, not to see Haifa again for many years. Finally, I saw my city 21 years later, on August 29th, 1969, when Comrade Salim Iswahi and I expropriated an imperialist plane and returned to Palestine to pay homage to our occupied country and to show that we had not abandoned our homeland. Ironically, the Israeli enemy, powerless, escorted us with his French and American planes. What I knew about Haifa had come from my parents and friends and from books. Now I saw Haifa from the air and formed my own cherished image of my own my home. Haifa is caressed by the sea, hugged by the mountain, inspired by the open plain. Haifa is a safe anchor for the wayfarer, a beach in the sun. Yet I, as a citizen of, of Haifa, 
am now allowed to bask in its sun, breathe its clear air, and live there with my people. European Zionists and their followers are living in Palestine by right of arms, and they have expelled us from our homeland. They live where we should be living, while we float about exiled. They live in my city because they are Jews and they have power. My people and I live outside because we are Palestinian Arabs without power. But we, the graduates of the desert ends, we shall have power and we shall recover Palestine and make it a human paradise for Arabs and Jews and lovers of freedom. I love High Alpha, as does my family and all Palestinians. At the outset, my love for High Alpha was sentimental, a child's love for a dreamland. As I grew older and began to read and think for myself, I discovered that I have historic roots, that my people have a historic struggle, and that my nation is the equal, if not the superior, of other nations. Above all, I learned that my class, the working people, the unemployed, the refugee, the oppressed everywhere could liberate mankind from the shackles of superstition and backwardness. I had to forget what the colonial school system had endowed to instill in me that I had no history, that there was no Palestinian people, no Arab nation. And in my search for freedom, I discovered some of our legendary heroes and the golden age of Arabism and realized how historians, in quotes, have skillfully belittled our achievements and consigned us to oblivion. I knew that I had a role to play. I realized that my historic mission was a my historic mission was as a warrior in the inevitable battle between oppressors and oppressed, exploiters and exploited. I decided to become a revolutionary in order to liberate my people and myself. I was greatly inspired by a Palestinian revolutionary of the 1930s, Is Adin Kassam, a man who embodied the spirit of resistance and who organized the first working class and peasant revolution in the Arab homeland. He had been organizing his underground for several years. In 1935, seeing the continuing betrayal of his people, he launched an armed struggle, which he intended to be the beginning of a people's war of liberation against the enemies, British imperialism, Zionism, and Arab backwardness. The revolutionaries were workers, peasants, students, and other progressive groups. The revolt was a revolt of the oppressed, and it was suppressed by the British with the aid of the Zionist and Arab reactionaries. Palestine was lost to Zionism between 1936 and 1939, not between 1946 and 1948, as historians would have us believe. In 1936, a peasant uprising engulfed the entire country in a general strike that lasted from April to October. His goal was to ensure was to ensure Palestinian Arab identity by the establishment of a democratic state, the expulsion of the British, and the cessation of Zionist immigration to Palestine. The only result was that the British set up one of their time-honored imperial devices, the Royal Commission, which in 1937 recommended the, the parition of Palestine. The Defense Party of Palestine, a front organization of King Abdullah, and the British, oh, I'm sorry, and oh, lost my place. A front organization of King Abdullah and the British agreed to the proposal. The revolutionary struggle intensified, but resistance was finally crushed by a traitorous Palestinian, Palestinian leadership and its quote unquote peaceful regiments, by Arab government trusteeship and its mediation, and finally by British Zionist military collaboration. Qassam was martyred. His martyrdom precipitated a political cataclysm, but his revolution was finally buried by his enemies. His memory was blotted out by his detractors. The popular front for the liberation of Palestine begins where Qassam left off. His generation started the revolution. My generation intends to finish it. I learned the history of the, of the upheaval of the 1936 revolution largely from books but I know the history of my people since 1948, from the bitterness of my own experience. I left High Alpha four days after my fourth birthday on, on April 13, 1948. My birthday was not celebrated because April 9th was a day of national mourning in Palestine. 
I am now 29 years old and I have not celebrated a single birthday since and will not do so until I return to Haifa. I did not leave Haifa of my own free wish. The decision was not made by my family, but by a people who should have known better, a persecuted and hunted race who in turn became my persecutors and hunters of my brethren. My family had cordial relations with our Jewish neighbors. We lived on Stanton Street, which wasn't far from the Jewish quarter, Hadar, the fashionable Fifth Ave of Haifa. I knew Jewish children. Tomorrow, one of my best friends was Jewish, but I knew that there was no distinction between us. I was conscious of being neither Arab nor Jew. The turning point in my relationship with Tamara came on November 29th, 1947, when the UN petitioned Palestine between Tamara and ownership, oops, sorry, petitioned Palestine between Tamara and me. Tamara was awarded 56% of my land. Her own people claimed only 8% ownership of the whole land of Palestine, according to their own statistics. I was expected to accede to this demand and congratulate Tamara's people. I was expected to deny my humanity, acknowledge the moral legit legitimacy of the Zionist claims, and accept the status of being homeless in my home, a refugee in my own land. World Zionism, American imperialism, and all their allies sentenced me to a life of exile for being an Arab. Then they expected us to honor their decision and abide by it. Because if we abide by that decision, Zionist claims would be satisfied and their territorial expansion would end and their alias immigrations would cease. The UN decision to partition Palestine prompted a general strike that lasted for three days. The strike was totally ineffective. The Arab national movement was exhausted. It was a mere ghost, a disorganized, emotional mob. The traditional institutions disintegrated. The newer confederations of workers and peasants weren't sufficiently developed to take up the cause of national liberation. We were foredoomed. Sporadic violence broke out. Arabs killed Jews. Jews killed Arabs. But Jewish violence was organized and disciplined. They were thoroughly mobilized, and they knew what they were fighting for. Arab violence was ill-planned, random activity carried on by individuals. The Zionists had camaraderie as well as gunpowder. They had well-organized armed forces, and they excelled in psychological warfare. Their leaders were at the head of their columns. Ours were securely enconced in Mount Lebanon or Cairo. The Zionists were thus able to snatch Haifa out from under us, particularly after Sir John Club Pasha, the commander of the Arab Legion of Jordan, ordered his Haifa regiment to withdraw in agreement with British plans to evacuate Haifa and ensure Jewish victory. With careful coordination and brilliant military strategy, the Zionists thought they could attain their goal with a minimum of effort and loss of life. They did. Most of the 80,000 Arab inhabitants of Haifa left without battling to the death for their city. They departed in an atmosphere of terrorism. Their exodus started on April 9th, my birthday, the day the Zionists massacred in cold blood the people of Deir Yazin, a crime which the Zionists cruelly but cleverly magnified to frighten the remaining population into submissive departure. Haifa was electrified by the murder of 254 people and the wounding of hundreds more. The people of Haifa feared that they were on the eve of a much greater massacre. Terror and panic prevailed. Two days later, the violence touched me. I saw death for the first time. I do remember being terrified, but I don't remember whether the dead person was Arab or Jew. I only remember hearing bombs exploding and seeing the blood squirting from the dying man's stomach. I hid under the staircase and stared at the corpse in the street outside. I trembled and wondered whether this would be the fate of my father. The spread of death and terror and fear for our future impelled my family and most other Arabs to leave. The eight of us and my mother left for a sour on April 13th, 1948. My instinctive reaction was that I must remain at home. Nobody explained to me why we were leaving and I didn't understand. 
My mother packed the children into the little rented car with a few of our personal belongings and was ready to set off until she counted the children and found that one was missing. All knew instantly that I was the one. Two of my sisters found me hiding behind the date box and hauled me out like a sack of potatoes. Nawal screamed, the Jews will kill you if you don't come, as she pulled me by the hair. I was infuriated and still couldn't understand why we were going to sour. My father bade us farewell, gave me a tearful kiss, and remained behind. I remember the figure of despair growing smaller in the distance. I also remember that this was the last time I saw the staircase of our house. I didn't see my father again for several months, and when he came to Sour, he was a broken man. Apparently, my father had no intention of leaving. He intended to remain no matter who controlled Haifa. However, our home and his business were seized on April 22nd, immediately after the fall of Haifa. He had to watch Zionists moving into our home. He saw our furniture carted off, then he himself was deported to Egypt. My father managed to reach Saur by the late summer of 1948. He arrived penniless after working hard for three decades as a shopkeeper, never allowed to become a Lebanese citizen. Father truly felt the meaning of rejection. He was thrown out of his country and then denied citizenship in a neighboring Arab country. He remained exiled in Lebanon until his death in 1966. For 18 long years, he lived in Lebanon, dreaming of returning to Haifa. I, as his daughter, am attempting to re realize that dream. I shall not fail my father and my nation. If I am unable to return and live in freedom in Palestine, my children will return. Historians and the Pliable West media tried to tell us that the people of Haifa left their city while the Jewish mayor called for coexistence and cooperation. Even if we presume the mayor's call to have been genuine, would that have stopped the bloodshed and the systemic expulsion of my people? Would that have suddenly made the Zionists change their program of conquest and subjugation of the Arabs? If the mayor had been sincere, why didn't he command his Zionist hordes to cease firing? Why didn't he stop the murder of my brothers and the rape of my sisters? If the Zionists desired coexistence, why didn't they and the quote-unquote innocent British prepare hundreds of little boats to transport the people of Haifa to Saur, Zay Zayada, and Acre? Again, I'm pronouncing all of these wrong, and I apologize. Zionist deeds were, mere, were more eloquent than their words. The Zionists wanted us out of Haifa and Palestine, and they succeeded in forcing us to leave, while making the world believe we left voluntarily. We did not leave voluntarily. And if we did, what law or morality gave the Zionists the right to occupy our homes and take our possessions? That is the question which the realist historian must answer and the fact that every self-respecting Jew must live with. It is also reported that the Palestinian Arabs hoped to return to their homes after the invading, quote-unquote, Arab armies had reoccupied Haifa, driven the Jews into the sea, and restored their rights. As to, quote-unquote, invading Arab armies, the so-called seven Arab states dispatched some 20,000-odd troops under the most adverse conditions. They were neither well-trained nor equipped with modern weapons. They faced an enemy with over 60,000 committed and trained troops. The Arabs had no central command and no moral to speak of, morale to speak of. If any heroic deeds were achieved, they were the deeds of individuals, not armies. The Arab armies were merely the sacrificial lamb of a dying social order which sent a mob of soldiers to face a modern en enemy thinking it could win an easy victory and take a new lease on life. The Arab, quote-unquote, invasion, as it turned out, merely gave the Zionists a pretext to add a substantial proportion of the UN-created Arab Palestine to the Jewish share and enabled King Abdullah and his Palestinian cohorts to liberate, liberate, yeah, liberate the country of Palestine by annexing the remainder of Palestine to Jordan. Moreover, the Arab intervention gave the Israelis a feeling of invincibility. I vividly remember my mother saying to me, shortly after our arrival in Lebanon, 
that I must not pick oranges from the grove nearby. I was puzzled and insisted on knowing why. My poor mother, with tears streaming from her eyes, explained, Darling, the fruit is not ours. You are no longer in Hayafa. You are in another country. Before she rushed into the house to wipe her tears and hide her shame, she looked at me with motherly firmness, saying, Henceforth, you are forbidden to eat oranges that are not ours. With childlike acceptance, I nodded my head, but her words still echo. For the first time, I began to question the injustice of our exile. As a child of four, I found myself burdened by the adult problems of life and death, right and wrong. I, as a dreamer, living on the bare substance of provided by the UN blue ration card in a crowded room on a side street in Sar, stand as a witness to Zionist inhumanity. I charged the world for its acquiescence in my destruction. My family and I sank into a mood of quiet despair and settled into a routine of sordid living. Of the summer of 1948, I recall nothing besides accompanying my older sisters, Nawal, Sakaya, and Raha, to the United Nations of Relief and Work Agency, INRA, Provision Bureau, to collect our miserable rations. My sisters were humiliated. My mother was angry. While we lived on international charity, the Zionists enjoyed the fruits of our labor in Palestine. Western friends tell me that the Zionists claimed that when they quote-unquote pioneered Palestine, there were no people there, that there were only marial swamps and arid deserts, which they turned into green plains and rolling valleys. Friends also tell me that the Zionists want peace and that we, the Arab marauders, continuously infiltrate into Palestine to burn, murder, and steal. In the autumn of 1948, I was placed in the Shika kindergarten to keep out of mischief. I enjoyed the company of the other children. I was quite boyish and aggressive. I played and fought with the boys. Our teacher, Zienna, was an energetic little old lady who loved children and dedicated her life to them. She truly cared for us and taught us to care for our fellow men. She was an upright and strong person and sought to pass on her values to us, but the children didn't seem to appreciate her sermons. We had no program of study at school. It was merely a babysitting affair, but Zaniah was a devoted Muslim patron, matron who thought that teaching us the Holy Quran was a noble mission. Without teaching us the alphabet or giving us any other kind of instruction, she asked us, children, between the ages of five and six, to commit substantial portions of the Quran to memory, and we did. Graduation from Chicago was no easy task. Each prospective graduate had to recite sections of the Quran in public, almost like a doctoral defense for children. I delighted in my own word-perfect performance, particularly when I was reciting the story of Joseph and how he fled to Egypt with the child Jesus to escape death at the hands of Herod but was later banished at the behest of the Pharisees, the higher Jewish clergy, the Zionist prototypes. The teacher and the children were overjoyed. I was ecstatic. As I finished the last verse, a child ran from the schoolhouse carrying the news to my mother and demanding al Helwena, a worthwhile reward. My poor mother could only afford to give her a few sweets. When I arrived home cheerfully announcing my graduation, my mother also gave me some sweets and a big kiss. I had expected a gift and a big celebration, but nothing happened. I cried my eyes out, now realizing that mother was unable to buy me a dress, a doll, or even a pair of socks. My uncle Kamun, who did have money, had heard of the news. He asked me whether it was true. I said yes. He gave me a little test and was very impressed. He couldn't believe that a child of six could have memorized whole portions of the Quran. To show his appreciation, he gave me one whole Lebanese pound, the equivalent of 25 pence. This was the first pound I had ever earned. I was j jumping with joy, gave him a big hug, and ran home to announce the big victory to my mother and to emphasize her naggardliness. 
Mother smiled approvingly as I displayed the pound and boasted about the generosity of my uncle, her brother, but I had no idea of what to do with my prize, so I gave it to my mother. She returned to me 25 pastries, saying, This is yours, Layla. Do as you wish with it. A few days later, I bought a gift for my teacher and sweets for the children with my treasure. In the autumn of 1950, I was enrolled in grade one at the Union of Evan Evangelical Churches School for the Palestinians, but only after a struggle. That summer, I had learned to read on my own by attentively listening to my sisters and picturing the passages of the Quran in my mind. Since I was Zakiah's constant companion, I knew what she knew and learned what she learned. She was going into the fourth grade, and I decided I wanted to be in the same grade, especially after discovering that the two pre-elementary grades plus the first two grades were going to be housed in a tent on the grounds of the schoolhouse. That the teacher placed me in the first pre-elementary grade and proceeded as if nothing was wrong. I was shocked and objected strenuously. I shouted out that I ought to be placed in grade four. Everyone laughed. Examine me and you'll see, I demanded. I was able to read fourth grade level Arabic without making a mistake. Then she examined me in mathematics, and I knew enough to pass. English was my downfall. I knew the alphabet and a few words that my sisters used around the house. I was able to recognize the English alphabet as she wrote it on the backboard, but I made a disastrous mistake when I read the letter O in English as five in Arabic, which in fact took the same form. The teacher burst out laughing. You see, I knew you didn't know enough to be even in grade two, never mind grade four. But since you're such a bright little girl, you won't have to spend two years in pre-elementary school. I will place you in grade one. I made my point and achieved a real academic victory. But I also felt a momentary letdown because I still had to remain in the tent outside the schoolhouse. Henceforth, I was no longer a child learning songs and games, but a serious pupil learning Arabic, math, and English. Also, as a student in grade one, I earned the right to my own slate with a sponge and lead chalk. Mother made me a cloth school bag from a piece of one of her old dresses. I was delighted that I had so much. In grades one and two, I enjoyed school and settled down to a quote-unquote normal existence in exile. There was only one significant incident during these years in my life, which had to do with demonstrations commemorating the loss of Palestine. Although I was passionately aware of the Palestinian tragedy for some reason or other, I thought the demonstration on May 15, 1951, was a mere interference with my schoolwork. The school was closed for the occasion, but I did not participate. I asked my mother what the demonstrations meant. Realizing that I was the only child of walking age who had remained at home, she replied angrily, as a Palestinian girl, you should have joined your sisters to protest against the Zionist occupation of Palestine. I agreed that the demonstration was desirable, but insisted that schoolwork was more important. Mother was surprised by my treasonous talk and lectured me on the three historic days of betrayal that every Palestinian should remember. The Balfour Declaration of November 2nd, 1917, the Petition of Palestine November 29th, 1947, and the proclamation of the State of Israel, May 15th, 1948. Ever since, these dates have become a vital and integral part of my life. 1952 was a turning point in my life. I was only eight years old, but the onrush of events and the background of my world of exile forced me to be politically aware. My brother first drew me into politics. I recall the first political debate between Mother Muhammad and my father. Muhammad, who was 17, was enthusiastically relating to the family how, I, how a group of young Egyptian army officers overthrew the corrupt king Farouk, Farouk of Egypt. Father was opposed to the revolt and insisted that the officers were a group of military upstarts who knew nothing about politics and overthrew a king who had fought for the defense of Palestine in 1948. Muhammad was furious. He reminded father that the king was a British political stooge who lost the war in Palestine and did nothing for four years to help recover Palestine. Moreover, Muhammad continued, 
the king and his routine, uh, lost my place. The king and routine were decadent to the bones and they squandered the wealth of Egypt on themselves rather than on the people. The family was cheering for Muhammad as he proved that he was better informed than father. Muhammad had collected documentary evidence from Rose El Yosef, an Egyptian journal, and, pa and pasted it on the wall of the boy's room. He read it all to father, who acquiesced and proudly congratulated his eldest son on being so well informed and committed to the revolution. Muhammad became our political commentator, and all of us, especially the girls, learned enormously from him. Furthermore, being at the American University of Beirut on a scholarship added to his prestige and put him in close association with the fledging Arab youth movement, which provided him with a wealth of information and orga organizational skill. In the autumn of 1952, I enrolled at the same exclusive Palestinian school set up by the churches. This was the year of discovery and commitment. In the next three or four years, my political and social ideas were formed and my political ties were made. A series of unrelated incidents set the stage for my politi politicization. A violent storm, a harsh cold, a collection for a refugee girl. The pleasant summer of 1952 turned into a violent winter in early December. A storm struck and blew over our school tent, which held 70 children. A few were injured. The rest of us had the daylight scared out of us. In the midst of pouring icy rain, tears, and mud, I stood silently crying as the children screamed and ran for cover. It was a symbol of our ruined Arab homeland. Local protests and heart-rending stories followed, but do no avail. Western Christian charity had its limits, and the tent was re-erected. There was no alternative. At this point, the tent had little or no meaning to me. It was not long after this incident that it began to dawn on me that tens of thousands of people permanently lived in tents, not just for games or schooling. In early 1953, a bitter cold spell set in in Sar. Beautiful white snow covered the mountains of Lebanon and the mountains of Galilee. Slush and ice covered the whole town. I caught a bad cold, but we had no medicine and I had to keep on going to school in my worn-out sandals. One windy February day, I struggled home through nearly two feet of snow. I was freezing to death, and I entered the house crying pitifully. I shouted, I can't take anymore. I need a pair of socks and a pair of shoes. Sandals without socks are for the summer, not for the winters of Lebanon. Mother looked at me sadly. Darling, don't you think I know that? If you did, I screamed. You'd buy me a pair of shoes and socks. Angrily, she answered. You should be thankful you have a pair of sandals to wear and a house to come to. Other children have neither sandals nor homes. They don't even have enough to eat. Do you understand, Layla? Do you? No, I don't, I replied angrily. But I inquired further. Why don't they have sandals, homes, and bread? Why don't they have them? Mother replied quietly. They have no money because their parents are like us. They lost their homes in Palestine and there is no work available in Lebanon. You see, Layla, those Palestinians who had no relatives elsewhere in the Arab world had no place to go but the open desert or the slums of Arab towns and somehow survived until UNRWA was organized. Imagine where we might have landed had we not had relatives in Sara and had not had a few bracelets from the old days which I could sell to buy you food for the first few months. Where would we have gone? Where would we be now? I wonder if you would have survived to this day. What might have happened to you and your sisters and brothers had I been killed or taken away by the Zionists when we were on our way from Haifa to Sar? Don't you know that the Zionists slaughtered our people and those who escaped them died of thirst or starvation? I could tell you a million tales of woe, but I want you to know only this. You are an alien here in Lebanon, and your homeland is under foreign occupation. We fought and fought valiantly to save the land. We lost and were driven out. You, Layla, and your brothers and sisters must never forget Palestine, and you must do your utmost to recover her. 
I imagined I was listening to a sad story that had happened somewhere else to someone else. I was affected deeply, but I didn't feel that I was a part of the story. The truth finally hit me in the spring of 1953 when I was nine. I was competitive and regarded myself as the brightest child of not only my family, but of my class. My self-assurance was undermined by Samira, a little girl from the camps, the scum of the earth, so I thought. I was terribly upset when I learned that she stood first in the class way ahead of me. I despised her. My jealousy overwhelmed me. I think I even hit her, and I locked in a hair-pulling match. She promptly separated us. Surprised to see her two smartest pupils fighting. Outside, the fighting resumed. I was the aggressor once again. The teacher took me inside for a little talk. It was a talk I shall never forget. She explained to me that poor peasant children were just as bright as my family and friends. Besides, she added, they are the true children of Palestine because they live on the land and cultivate and harvest it. Virtue is a part of the people of the land. And the simple folk are the backbone of all societies. Those peasants, she continued, did not leave Palestine willingly, like the rich people who now live in villas in Cairo and Beirut. They were forced out to make room for the Zionist intruders. Layla, those are the people of Palestine. You must learn to love them, be part of them, serve them. The lesson taught, she called Samira back into the room and told her to shake hands with me and to take me to her tent home to show me how she lived and her parents and hundreds of thousands of Palestinians lived. Samira did. After a tour of the camp, I realized that I was living in luxury. I knew how fortunate I was and how despicable and arrogant the rich people must be. I suddenly became aware of class differences in that upsetting spring for me. As I grew older, I acquired the, ne the necessary intellectual and moral ideology to understand what I have felt in that camp, why class society must be abolished and socialism established in its place. But Samira, my classmate and class sister, and Amira, my teacher and working class advocate, taught me that first lesson of true freedom and true humanity. They taught me more in a few hours than a thousand books could have done in a hundred years. And the camp, I saw misery, hunger, and humiliation. I saw the maimed, the, the diseased, the brokenhearted. I saw barefooted children with swollen stomachs, fathers with heads bowed, pale mothers with sickly babies, grandparents in despair. I saw the meaning of poverty and hunger and felt the despair of deprivation to my bones. I did not shy at the sight of filthy tents, and I was not deterred by the sight of death. I toured the whole camp and tried to feel how the people felt. I returned home, intoxicated by the wine of reality. I was crucified and redeemed at the same time. Ever since, I have loved the poor and marched with them to overthrow our mutual oppressor. Over 700,000 Palestinians still live in these refugee camps. Some of them do menial work in nearby towns, most of them rot in idleness. They live on meager UN doles and have no hope of salvation without an Arab-Palestinian revolution. My faith in myself and my fellow students was greatly strengthened in the spring of 1953 on Byram's Eve, the Easter of Islam. Most of the children were ready for a week's vacation. Most were talking about dolls, dresses, and the other gifts they expected to receive. A sad little girl in ragged clothes was sitting nearby all by herself. I didn't know her well, and I didn't ask her why she was so lonely and unhappy. Nabil, our teacher, was aware of her plight. After our break, he told us that it would soon be Easter and that all of us, with the exception of one little girl, would be receiving gifts. He said, I would be un-Muslim not to share our riches with the poor and certainly un-Arab not to be generous. I was excited maybe the time had come to storm UNRWA's office or a government house in Sawar, but Nabil had no such drastic measures in mind. One of you will not have a happy Easter unless she has a new dress for the occasion. I cannot afford to buy her a dress alone. Here, I am contributing 25 pastries, and if each one of you contributes two to five pastries, we could buy Hassana a dress. 
The children looked at each other, puzzled at the request. I was not. I knew what it meant to be poor. Having just visited the primitive camps, I stood up and announced, Here is my entire weekly allowance of five pastries. Most of the children followed suit, and we bought Hosanna a dress in the midst of our joyous tears. I decided not to wear my own new dress that year because thousands of Palestinian children had none. I loved my teacher, Nabil, adored his physical prowess and moral integrity. He in turn coddled me and treated me like a little sister. On the fifth anniversary of the creation of Israel, May 15, 1953, he and I marched at the head of the parade. With clenched fists, we shouted, Long live Arab Palestine. Palestine is ours. We shall return. Thousands of people, old and young, assembled in the town square to hear Nabil swear allegiance to the flag on behalf of all Palestinians. He spoke persuasively. Our parents lost Palestine, but our and our succeeding generations have an obligation to liberate our homeland. As he concluded his speech, he asked the crowd to look southward and to pledge before themselves and their fellow men to return to fight for Palestine. I had received the sacrament of revolution. I also learned a lesson from my cat, Sarah. She was black like me, and we were constant companions. I read my lessons to her. I took her for walks to the sea. I made clothes for her, bathed her, and brushed her like an infant. Sarah was my child. When she had her first litter of kittens, I acted as midwife. I was devoted to the kittens. When one died, I gave him a Muslim burial and visited his grave daily. Then one day I discovered a great big chicken eating the flowers off my kitten's grave. I caught him and in my childish fury wrung its neck. The incident caused an uproar around the house. Finally, the neighbor was dutifully told that her chicken had violated my rights of property. My mother insisted that I dispose of the kittens. After some searching, I found good homes for them. Then nature took its course and my cat became pregnant again. My mother was determined not to turn our home into a maternity hospital again, so she seized the cat, put her in a sack, and told my uncle to take her as far away as possible. I cried and pleaded with her, but she was unyielding. Uncle carried out the mission. I was catless for nearly one year. In the spring of 1954, I was 10 years old. On a bright, sunny morning on my way home from school, I saw my cat, Sarah, striding majestically on the top of the arc of a dilapidated building. I was overcome and rushed towards her, not completely certain if it was Sarah. It was indeed my cat, and I welcomed her with open arms. The whole family was overjoyed and regarded her return as miraculous. On Monday morning, the teacher asked us to write an essay on something very important that had happened in our lives. I was pleased to have the chance to write on the return of my dove to the ark. I wrote about the story of the flood, comparing it to the Zionist flooding of Palestine and portraying my cat as the dove of peace that foretold of the ebbing of the tide. I felt that if my cat could find her way back to me after one year, I ought to be able to find my way back to a liberated Palestine. My teacher, also a Palestinian, thought that the sentiment was noble and elevating and tried to instill in me a more scientific approach to the homeland. But to a child of 10, the homeland was a dream to excite the imagination, not an attainable goal. To extinguish the flame of revolution, safeguard Arab black gold and maintain United States strategic interests, America the creator, protector and supplier of weapons to Israel, the father, godfather and high priest of Zionism, set out in the early 1950s to create an extension to NATO and place our world in its orbit. John Foster Dules, the U.S. Secretary of State, visited the Middle East in March 1953. His country was in the grip of virulent McCarthyism, and Dules, as an ardent anti-communist, came to quote-unquote save us from the communist menace and turn us into docile democratic citizens of the free world. He sought to form a regional alliance tied to NATO and at the same time find a final settlement to the so-called Arab-Israeli conflict, which would ensure the continued supremacy of Western imperialism and its oil cartels in the area. The answer of my generation to Duel's attempts was a loud no. All the free groups worked together to frustrate his plans. It was rather fitting that opposition should commence at the American University of Beirut. 
but neither Doles nor his local supporters were aware of the death of nationalists, feelings that gripped the country. Nationalist students led the struggle for liberty under the vanguard of the Arab youth movement. They weren't frightened of death and were not scared off by the armed soldiers who tried to keep them at bay and protect duels. Young nationalists, off by the armed soldiers who tried to keep them at bay, protected duels. Oh, I'm sorry, I read that wrong. <laughs> Young nationalist revolutionaries broke through the army ranks and almost managed to slay the dragon of capitalism. Hell broke loose as the resurgent crowd moved towards their target. The army, uh, gendarmerie, and secret police moved in. Dozens of students were seized while hundreds of others were clubbed or crushed by mounted horsemen. My brother, Muhammad, participated in the demonstration and returned to tell the eager family about it. Though the country was profoundly shocked by the brutality of its own soldiers, it took another year of nationalist agitation and finally the murder of Hassan Abu Ishmael, the American University of Beirut student leader, for the country to wake up and disentangle itself from the web of the proposed American alliance system, the Baghdad Pact. The murder of Hassan was particularly terrible because it took place in front of the AUB, and the AUB administration refused to lodge a formal protest against the assassination of one of its students. Suddenly, people began to understand the meaning of Western democratic institutions and their political intentions toward the Middle East. But the unfolding drama of the 50s did not reach its denouement until the Suez War of 1956, when Britain and France, in concert with Israel, invaded Egypt, seeking to overthrow Nasir and impose a Ben Gurion kind of peace on the Arab people. The Declaration of May 25, 1950, in which the three great powers, Britain, France, and the USA, had guaranteed the territorial integrity and sovereignty independence of the Middle Eastern states and pledged to come to the aid of an aggrieved party, was trampled on by two of its signatories, Britain and France, and allowed to lapse by America when it was no longer of value to Zionism. The West failed to coerce the entire Arab world into a subservient alliance system under the wing of America. On the contrary, it forced a polarization in which Nazir's Cairo became the focal point of the nationalist awakening and Nuri's Baghdad, center of counter-revolution and the capital of northern tier advocates. All in all, Duels and Ike Eden and Macmillan, Ben Guran and Moshe Dion were not a totally unmitigated evil. They gave us a rude awakening for which we owe them a debt of gratitude. They forced us to re-examine the foundations of our society. No longer did the Arabs have to undergo long periods of self-delusion to distinguish friend from foe and to uncover the enemy within and without. I'm gonna go ahead and stop there. I'm probably going to have this space uh, 11 a.m. my time. If um, y'all keep an eye out on my page, I'll make the space right after this one ends. And that way, if y'all want, y'all can set the reminder so that we can pick up where we left off. So um, I'm going to make I'm going to end this space. I'm going to schedule the next one and set the reminder and I'll finish it. I believe we, we all should read this together, especially what's going on now. And it's so important to read about the revolutionaries of Palestine, because, again, and this what we're seeing here, right, what we're seeing here is that we're seeing a mass lynching in a form of genocide. <laughs> and why does these lynchings take place is to make us all fear resistance and to fear of revolution. So I believe our part and what we can do along with, you know, direct action and protest and solidarity is, again, remember that there are revolutionaries on the ground. There is a resistance happening, an ongoing Palestinian resistance, and we need to learn about it and support it and amplify it. So when the famous Layla Khalid, a true revolutionary, we're going to read her autobiography. So I'll end this space on that. And I want to thank those who listened and who shared. I appreciate it. And I hope others get a chance to have access to this recording and to listen as well. The PDF is also available. And I'm going to go ahead and schedule this place. I'm going to try for 11 a.m so that I can get through the whole reading in one city. So y'all take care of each other. Look out for each other, for real. And always, y'all, let's get free. <laughs>